heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, ARM files for its IPO, which is set to be one of the biggest of the year. We bring you the biggest takeaways from its filing. Plus, we talk earnings with the CFO of Zoom as analysts sour on long-term growth for the video conferencing company. And Microsoft pushes to get its Activision deal done finally. It's submitting a new bid to the CMA in the UK. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout this hour. Of course, including the macro environment we find ourselves, the way in which tech has continued to outperform other benchmarks on the day, even in the face of rising yields once again in the borrowing market. We're seeing the Nasdaq up just a quarter of a percent. We've seen whipsawing coming from some key names. All eyes on NVIDIA, are, of course, as we head towards the closing bell. The two-year yield just up about a basis point. And in fact, we're seeing a bit of a calmness in the bond market that has seen sustained pressure. All eyes, of course, not only on earnings coming this week for some big, big tech bellwethers, but Jay Powell come Friday, of course, from Jackson Hole, what he says about the future of borrowing costs here in the U.S. I'm looking at what's happened in China. Interesting volatility in China's trading, the fact that we actually saw a pickup in buying, particularly on the CSI. And I'm looking at the crane shares, the K-Web, as it's known. Basically, some of the key ETF, key internet names traded here in the U.S., just holding on to gains of about a tenth of a percent, but coming off of their highs. Moving on, to what is the key risk asset of choice often in this show. We're seeing off about 7 tenths of percent now crypto, Bitcoin, as we see under continued pressure at about 26,000 there or thereabouts, Ed. But what have you got on the micro? Yeah, there's a lot to get through this Tuesday. Earnings is a part of it. Zoom is off by nine tenths of a percent, but off session lows. A slight ad adjustment higher for guidance on sales. Strength in enterprise, but single digit declines are happening with individual customers, small businesses that were using the video platform from Zoom. We will speak to the CFO. Lots of questions from the street about well, what happens if the macro picture gets better? And what are you guys going to do with your capital? Those are questions that we'll ask. As you pointed out, Activision and Microsoft is a big, big story. The concession from Microsoft is to allow another video games publisher, Ubisoft, to sell Activision's titles through cloud gaming markets globally. Will that be enough for the CMA to get the deal over the line? We will go to our reporter on that one. The big, big story, the one we've all been waiting for, and finally it's here, is ARM, the chip uh, design software name finally filing for its IPO, we didn't actually learn much about the share sale in the documents. What we do know is that SoftBank will still be the single, uh, single biggest controlling shareholder after the transaction. Bloomberg's reported that the target valuation, 60 to 70 billion US dollars, if they raise around $10 billion, this will be not just the biggest IPO of the year here in the United States, Caroline, but the biggest IPO going back to Rivian's in November 2021. There's this big idea that could this be the starting gun for the IPO market when it comes to tech? Lots to cover. And that is so much of where the narrative has been, what this means for the broader market. But what does it mean in terms of the actual technology that is driving this name? Bloomberg's Ian King, of course, has been all over not only the entire semiconductor space, but what ARM brings to that space. And Ian, what struck you? For many, it was exposure to China. But where did you get the narrative of what this business actually does in the filing? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, they're trying to reposition themselves as being uh, a, a different, more evolved company from where they were when they were originally uh, publicly traded and then bought by SoftBank. And really, um, while it's not really appearing in the filings, what we're understanding is that the real sales pitch here is going to be focused on, look, this is how important we are in the data center. We're more than just a, a mobile phone technology uh, company. The history of, of ARM is the provider of blueprints for smartphone processors. Yep. They, their designs led to energy efficiency. Think about battery life on a cell phone, crucial. Yep. They also have the IP or the code that determines how a chip interacts with the software you want to run through it. Yep. This is a big publicity stunt, right? It's like saying to the world, we're here, we're ARM. But how does it help them move that, that company forward? Because automotive data center, it's not what they've done historically. Yeah, I mean, you know, they are spreading, right? They are, their story has always been one of how quickly can we become as pervasive as we think we can be. 
and you know that that's really been a very strong story for them but at the same time they're trying to do more than that they're trying to kind of move up the stack to be more of a technology provider to do more of the designs to provide more of the complete sort of picture and be less reliant on the actual chip makers and that in theory brings their market a, a broader audience so companies like Amazon not traditionally a chip maker can design their own chips right they use arm as part of what they, goes into the AWS offering. 3,500 words were dedicated to China. Explain ARM's business exposure in China. Well, I mean, it's like many semiconductor companies in this country. It's, China is the biggest market for chips. You want to be there. But at the same time, Washington is more and more concerned about China's capabilities in chips and is taking steps to limit what U.S. or other companies outside of China can do inside China. So that's the conflict there, and that's why you saw the detailed discussions about these are the risks, this is what we have to think about. A slowing mobile environment, a China risk factor. But to be fair, since 2014, 2015, when I was back in London, I remember the arm taking me to their headquarters. I was in Cambridge. They were desperate to tell this whole Internet of Things discussion point under Simon Seegers at the time. that It has been a narrative they've been trying to build as to how they are more than mobile. What are they in terms of SoftBank's pitch? Why would SoftBank not be wanting to sell into also this AI euphoria at the moment? Are they wanting to perhaps keep hold of arm a little bit longer in the near term? Well, I mean, the, 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 I mean, we were going to come to market earlier this year and chip stocks were obviously not doing very well then. So I wouldn't read too much into the timing. I think SoftBank obviously needs a win given some of the other investments that it's made which haven't panned out. But in terms of the, the timing, and you mentioned the AI euphoria quite accurately, Caroline, that's where we are now. And the best way, I think, to think about what ARM has to say there is who's, in, who's reporting tomorrow, NVIDIA. Half of NVIDIA's sort of top-line product is a processor based on ARM technology. So they have a play, and that's something that they'll be trying to, I think, pitch to investors more strongly. All right, Bloomberg's Ian King. Mr. Chip, we call him, and I take it from me, it's been a busy few days for him. Let's stick with the story and bring in Glenn O'Donnell, Forrester Research Director and Vice President. Glenn, just very simply, you've been through the, the filing. What, what was the main takeaway from you of what we learned about ARM's IPO? It's it's uh, it's trying to capitalize, as Ian pointed out, uh, you know, with the AI craze going on right now. This is a good time to uh, to capitalize on that, because even though with AI most of the talk is about Nvidia, Nvidia's proce uh, processors need CPUs, a different kind of processor, to uh, to work properly, and uh, you know it has licensed ARM's technology to. Uh, you know, to give it that capability. But uh, lots of other players have these ARM designs, and it's really the brains behind a lot of what's, uh, what's, what's to come. So I think the timing of this uh, IPO is, uh, is, is really perfect. Glenn, put ARM in the ecosystem. Who are their competitors? Who are they managing to work with and against? Well, the biggest competitor is the established uh, Intel uh, AMD base, what we call x86 processors. And you know, j just about every PC has an x86 processor, and most data center systems have x86. These things are ubiquitous, and they're, they're not going to lose that ubiquity. However, ARM is going after a slice of that. And... Uh, it's interesting that even though these are two, you know, hyper competitive companies, uh, let's say Intel and, and AMD, uh, Intel has actually entered into an agreement to manufacture chips for ARM. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, with this, this whole concept of frenemies is pretty common in the tech space. It's too small a world not to have a few frenemies, Glenn. But Ed, uh -huh. it's interesting, isn't it, that even as we talk up this AI hype, even as we look towards yeah. Nvidia after the bell. We did get numbers in the filing, and quite clearly there is a slight slowdown being felt by ARM in this macro environment. Ed. Yeah, you, you can't outrun your main business, which I think, Glenn, the numbers showed sales were down 1% in the period ending March of this year, on the year. Um, yeah. You know, what did that tell you about the health of their main business, principally the association with smartphone processors? Well, smartphones are down, as we all know. And you know, semiconductor stocks and companies have been suffering. 
the economic slowdown uh, has has had a, a, a really strong impact on all of them. And, um, you know, it hasn't been a good couple of quarters for these companies. But, you know, there is a turnaround in, in uh, underway. And, and again, it's fueled by all this AI stuff, uh, most notably generative AI. And I've, I've been through a number of AI waves that didn't pan out, but this one's different. And, yes. uh, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see a, a huge surge in demand for uh, chips that are able to process these, uh, these uh, workloads that people are going to be throwing at it. And, and we're seeing that with NVIDIA. NVIDIA is already saying, hey, we can't make enough of these things. And demand is just yes. uh, off, off the charts. So ARM, ARM is going along for that ride in a big way because it has a, that complementary connection to what NVIDIA is riding. Glenn, I get it. You're a financial analyst, right? We love to pour over the numbers, but the thing I love about IPOs is just hype, the story, <laughs> the publicity. How important is it to your mind that, that the world knows about Arm, that they hear about this big IPO of a company called Arm that they may never have heard of? Yeah, well, they never had, have heard of it. Most people haven't. And you know, for the most part, they don't really make the chips. They license the technology. So you may have heard of Samsung, and of course you've heard of Apple, and Qualcomm, all of these companies, and, and of course NVIDIA, all these companies are building their chips, their processors on ARM-based uh, designs, the architecture. So uh, ARM is really uh, an intellectual property company and uh, you know they make their money off licensing and other intellectual property that they've developed that other companies can use. And the more companies that build their processors based on ARM, the better ARM is going to do. And I, I, I just see that uh, there's good times ahead for that. Glenn O'Donnell, finishing on an optimistic note, we thank you of Forrester Research. Great setup as well he has for the mic. Meanwhile, coming up, well, how's your setup at home? Is Zoom it? It's like a video conferencing company, of course, that just reported its second quarter results and actually raised its full year forecast for both adjusted earnings and revenue. But analysts perhaps wanting more clarity on longer term growth prospects. So we're going to dig into that with the CFO. This is Bloomberg Technology. Zoom, of course, the video conferencing company we all know reported second quarter results and boosted the outlook with a move beyond video calls, of course, and about phones and the like. But let's dig into the future visibility of strength for this business. Kelly Stackelberg, Zoom CFO, joins us now. And it's interesting. We, we saw some excitement around the numbers being posted after the bell yesterday. And then reality hits a little bit today amid a macro picture that is worrying. Can you give your investor base, our audience, just some visibility into the future growth story for Zoom right now? Sure. So we were really pleased with our Q2 results. As you said, we beat both our top line revenue guidance as well as our profitability outlook. And we raised those numbers for the full year of FY24, both top and bottom line guidance. And what I think people are, are looking for is long term growth, which will be driven from the expansion of our platform, our new products, some of our newer products like uh, Zoom Phone, which is our cloud PBX solution, also Zoom Contact Center, which is only six quarters old and already has 500 customers on it. And that is our natively built, fully modern cloud contact center. We have lots of other uh, products across our platform too, like Zoom Scheduler. And all of this brings together a platform that as those products continue to mature, will drive growth. We're also looking for stabilization in the overall macro, as you mentioned, both in the U.S. and internationally, which is really important for us for both segments of our business. And as we work with our customers, as some of them you know, have gone through reductions in their own yes. employee base, we help them transition that spend potentially from meetings into some of our newer products. You know, Kelly, the, the, the Zoom story was really clear in the fiscal second quarter earnings gone, right? So top line growth of 10 percent overall, but sales to individuals and small businesses down 4.3 percent. OK, so in other words, enterprise, great, but the individual user every day, you and I falling away. How permanent is that dynamic in that story for your company? 
So the online segment of our business that you're referring to is about 40% of our business today. And it is individuals like, like you and I that are using the product, but it's also small businesses, which is really important to remember. A lot of these customers buy online and we are continuing to expand the opportunity by adding more currencies in which we sell, adding more products to the platform. So it's a very important part of our business and the team is consistently innovating around how do we bring more products to them and how do we expand the top of the funnel. We've seen a lot of stabilization in the churn rate there. We're down to pre-pandemic levels, which is really great. It's just gonna take a little longer than we expected to stabilize over time though. What about the euphoria that everyone wants to discuss that is AI? How much are you trying to lean into that for your investor base that wants to hear it? Or how much are you trying to be realistic about what it adds to your product portfolio? Yeah, so we think that AI is a really important strategic part of our product portfolio going forwards. We just hired XD Wong, for example, to lead that initiative. We're thrilled to have him as part of our team. And, you know, Eric talked about it a little bit on the call yesterday. We have individual SKUs today that already leverage a lot of AI. We have Zoom Virtual Agent, for example, which is part of our contact center solution. But we also will bring those benefits into the broader platform without necessarily adding a lot of cost to our customer base. We want them to get the benefit from it. And we will talk more about additional features or products that really leverage AI to the hilt when it comes out in uh, Zootopia, which is our users conference in October. Kelly, there was a pretty strong reaction to news that Zoom was pushing its workforce back to the office. You know, many uh, saw that with a sense of irony, right? Given the role that your technology played in the work from home era. It, was that severe reaction justified? Do you mind are you surprised that people were, were so surprised in their own mind? that you have made that move? Well, we believe that a structured hybrid approach is best for Zoom. We hear from our employees, they want to be together for collaboration. So by structuring days in the office, just two days in the office, by the way, it, it you know, ensures that when they come to the office, they're gonna see their colleagues, they're gonna see their friends. It also really helps drive innovation. We are the best to leverage our products to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our customers who are also in a hybrid environment. And so by leveraging Zoom rooms and new features like Intelligent Director, we're able to ensure that we're being the best possible products to market. All right, Kelly Steckelberg, Zoom ZFO, thank you for joining us so close after earnings here on Blue Technology. Coming up on the show, Microsoft looks to push its Activision deal over the finish line with a new proposal to the UK CMA. We're going to have those details next. Caro. And Ed, it is earnings season, thick and fast. I want to shine a light on one that you might not automatically associate with technology, but you should. Macy's, of course, owner of Bloomingdale's, Blue Mercury, and of course, the actual brand Macy's itself, having its worst day since March 2022, the lowest since January 2021. This is a macro play. This is a worry about the consumer, about a buildup in delinquencies, but they are still focused very much on technology and on AI. Let's just have a quick look at how they're focusing on digital. This helped could really trim some of their inventory. They're pulling that, that back by 10%. They're still saying they've got more to go. Jeff Gannett telling me on the phone, our aspirations in digital are quite high and we want it to be healthier than it is today. We do believe that in the future, digital can grow more aggressively within the balance of the company. Of course, they're leaning into Marketplace, which is where they offer far more products through their online offering. They've also got a new chief for digital on this particular announcement. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. And first up, Baidu, reporting revenue that rose by the most in more than a year. Sales jumped 15%, which was ahead of expectation. China's search leader is joining its tech peers in rediscovering growth as Beijing relaxes its grip on the private sector. And Microsoft got a new chance at winning approval from UK regulators after the tech giant submitted a substantially different deal to the country's antitrust watchdog for its $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard. The CMA will now open a new New deal probe after Microsoft said it would give Ubisoft rights to distribute Activision games globally. Karen. What a move. 
Let's get more on that story. Microsoft and Activision with Bloomberg's Leo Nyland. And well, we were waiting to hear how they were perhaps going to appease the regulators in the UK. And did this one take you by surprise? Well, we had reported um, a little bit ago that they were looking at this potential move. So what they're going to do is they are divesting globally the cloud gaming rights to Ubisoft. Um, it'll be a non-exclusive license in the EU so that um, Microsoft is still abiding by the commitments that it made to European Commission antitrust authorities. The CMA will now do sort of a redo of the probe to see if this resolves their concerns about cloud gaming. The EU also said today that they may need to look at it again just to make sure that yes. it still complies with all the commitments Microsoft made to them. We, we actually had an interview with the CMA chief, Sarah Ricardo, on Bloomberg Radio earlier. This, for me, was the most interesting part of what she said. What we see with this new deal, and we have to test it carefully through our review, is that rather than Microsoft being able to control how those cloud streaming rights are used, that control will shift to an independent company. It's always been a battleground for the cloud, right, Leah? This is what the CMA's bugbear has been. Yeah, the CMA and the EU have been very focused on the cloud because they think that's sort of the next generation of gaming here. You know, right now, so much of stuff relates to consoles, whether you have an Xbox or a PlayStation. But in the future, people think that you might just, you know, connect to your TV or your phone to play these games. Sort of in the same way that, you know, we used to watch DVDs and now everybody streams TVs and movies. And so they've been very, very focused on the cloud and how they were concerned that Microsoft would sort of dominate in this industry. And now by having them license these rights to somebody else, um, that might resolve some of their concerns. They've been very clear that they still need to look at it. This is still an ongoing process. They're not definitely saying that they're going to accept it, but um, they'll start reviewing it and they will be done before the October 18th deadline. All right, Bloomberg's Leah Nile now the DC. The cloud, it really was such a preoccupation, Caroline, for both parties as well, because they tried so hard to point out to all regulators that it's now right in this moment teeny tiny, mm -hmm. you know, and the whole point of the deal originally anyway was mobile. Microsoft wanted Activision. We continue to chase this one. It's unbelievable, the drama behind Microsoft and Activision. Anyway, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Web3 platform MoonPay has a new initiative to enhance the consumer-to-brand experience. Kara's going to tell us more about this one, but co-founder and CEO Ivan Soda Wright is going to also add to the conversation and the trends that he's seeing in the broader crypto market. Real quick, Tesla, up for a second day. Friday, it closed down for the sixth consecutive session, its worst streak of declines for the year. Actually, it's now slightly softer, two tenths of one percent, but it's a stock that's rebounded actually in the last 48 hours. From SF and New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's get a quick check on the markets, Karen. NASDAQ 100 actually a little bit softer, down two tenths of one percent. We're coming off the biggest jump on that tech heavy index in Monday session in more than three weeks. Tech had kind of turned a corner and now we're treading water a little bit. Factors include, but are not limited to, what we're seeing in earnings, what we're seeing ahead of earnings, of course, NVIDIA reports after the bell tomorrow, but also a few jitters about the global economy. Jackson Hole is this week. My goodness, what a lot for investors to take on board. There are two pieces of news out there that are also uh, particularly relevant to the fintech and crypto space. I'm looking at Adyen and Coinbase. Adyen, uh, you'll remember we covered in the show last week, a record drop after sales really pulled away. But Kathy Wood's arc across two ETFs has been buying both the Amsterdam listed shares and some of the US listed shares as well. Not doing much to support anything today. We're down 2.8% in the session. Coinbase also down 1%. It's taken a stake in Circle, saying in the filing that it sees some momentum in stable coins, but we don't have any details of the agreements. And the sell side are looking at this and trying to make their mind up, but that stock down 2%. Cara. Let's stick with crypto for a moment because MoonPay, it's a leading Web3 infrastructure provider, is taking a kind of hands-on interactive expertise to New York City's waterfront seaport neighborhood. I just got a little bit of a taste of what the experience would entail. Take a look. New York, New York. Who's here? What are they doing? Are they working? Are they visiting? Are they coming back for more? Information many would love, particularly owners of buildings and attractions. Well, could Web3 help with that? That's what the South Street Seaport owner is banking on. 
Howard Hughes is working with MoonPay to gamify its real estate. For three months, there'll be a scavenger hunt where real and digital worlds collide. Find the purple pearls, scan the codes, and collect the cool New York City-inspired digital tokens, or NFTs, if you want to use the crypto jargon. If you collect enough, you'll be entered in for real-life prizes. Think hotel stays, concert tickets, and the like. Experiences you can use or perhaps sell on the secondary market thanks to the blockchain technology being used here. What does Howard Hughes get in return? If you opt in, your email and zip code and a great understanding of where you come from, how you move through its seaport and crucially, if you return. So here's a case for crypto being used in the wild with a purpose, an application. Let's see how well people adopt it. Let's dig into it. We welcome MoonPay's co-founder and CEO of the program, Ivan Soto Wright. Great to have you with us, Ivan. Thanks for having me. So this is it, isn't it? This is how Web3, how crypto NFTs are applicable in our everyday life and applicable to companies. Do you, is that the proof point that you need at the moment in this macro market environment? I mean, for us at MoonPay, we're all about bringing this technology mainstream. And for us, we have to leave with the experience. The experience needs to be so simple, so intuitive, so easy for people to understand. In this case, it's really fun. It's a digital scavenger hunt. You go to the seaport. You'll see these QR codes all around the seaport. There's 10 of them. Uh, it's actually quite a challenging uh, scavenger hunt, so I'm excited to see how people get on with it. But once you scan one of these things, what's really cool is behind the scenes, we're using our technology. So we're actually setting up a wallet for each individual person. They're claiming one of these tokens, and then they get that prize every week, and that prize can be sold in the secondary market. I mean, I used it. I automatically had a wallet formed, and it was very seamless. I'm interested, though, that you're not at any point saying blockchain, Web3, crypto. It's very much just use the tech and see what it's all about. How much are you seeing companies wanting to use and adopt NFTs, crypto in this environment? How much are you managing to scale the business? Yeah, well, I think it's really analogous if you think about the internet, right? So we don't really talk about the technical components of you know, using social media or using the applications that you use in every single day, everyday life. It's very similar for blockchain. We need to get to a place where we remove that jargon and we just really focus on the use cases. For us, we really believe the future of the digital economy will be powered by a number of these digital wallets. Our core business at MoonPay is making it easy for people to top up their digital wallets. And so first, we've got to get people their digital wallet to begin with. And we think that's going to happen through working with brands, working with enterprises. Here, we're working at the Howard Hughes Corporation. This is an awesome initiative. We're really excited. There are some companies out there that are really forward-looking around how to actually use technology and think about you know, the latest advancements. And so for us, this is just a great use case, a really good case study. We can't wait to show the data the analytics around all the foot traffic coming in. How do we increase that foot traffic? How do we actually get more spending behavior? How can they justify their rents? So it'll be really exciting. So there we have it, Ed, like in terms of real estate wanting to justify their rents. We're also hearing more and more kind of NFTs, crypto. It's more becoming about loyalty in some way for companies as well. That seems to be some sort of proof point, Ed. You know, I'm not surprised to see you out there in the real world engaging with the technology. That's a space you know really well. But, but to your point, Karen, what you were just outlining, Ivan, how much is this about education? You know, that, that actually for the, the majority of the public out there, they're not competent in the area or familiar, and they just need some basic help in understanding use cases, why they should be using it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it all, always starts with education. I think that's probably the most important thing that we think about. And how do we have that education in a way that's delivered in a really actually fun way, where we're not actually, you know, opening up a textbook and learning about blockchain technology, we're actually out there in the wild, you know, scanning a QR code, but actually, wow, I'm getting this reward. And actually, when we think about loyalty and rewards, one of the biggest problems that we've had is actually engagement with loyalty and reward programs. A lot of companies have struggled to have people actually use loyalty and rewards. And so in this case, I think the secondary market component of the blockchain is really powerful. Anyone with an open internet connection, let's say you win the uh, prize uh, tickets uh, to the concert. Uh, let's say you're not going to be in the seaport uh, for a couple of weeks, you're not going to be able to go to that concert. You can actually list them on a platform like OpenSea, on the open internet, and anyone can go and purchase them. Ivan, you've operated an NFT checkout since 2022. How is the market for NFT, NFTs right now? I feel like when Caroline and I discuss that market on the show of late, it's because values have come down uh, in a shocking way. You know, Justin Bieber is the example that we've embodied, which we constantly bring up on this show. 
Yeah, I mean, from, from our perspective, we take a very long-term view, right? This is a nascent asset class, and when I think about NFTs, they're more than just collectibles. They're a new file format. They're a file format to things that live natively on the blockchain. And so, really, when we think about MoonPay, we're an infrastructure business. You know, we want to be behind the scenes. We want to enable as much activity. When you look at the developers that have come into the space, we're actually up 90% in developer activity since 2020. Interesting that you mentioned developers. What about talent more broadly, Ivan, at the moment? Are you actively hiring? We understood at one point that maybe people were leaving the company. Was that because it was time that they wanted to have new opportunities? Were you having to let go of people? So at MoonPay, we operate with a operating principle called Kaizen, which means change for the better in Japanese. And so we're continuously looking at our company, making sure that we have the best people in every single seat. So we've actually remained flat as an organization. We've had people leave, we've had people come in, but we're, you know, we're consistently building here for the long term. Mm -hmm. We really believe we are, we are a player here to stay over the long term. Do you need more money? We just mentioned Justin Bieber as a pinup of who's lost money on NFTs. He's also a man who invested in you back in the day. Are you looking at raising more funds? No, we're in a really good financial um, position. You know, we're going to continue, just continue to build and just continue to focus. We've actually managed to outperform the market by over 30% this year, even the market being down 50%. So for us, that's really our benchmark. We compare ourselves against the market and we're taking a long-term view that this market will grow. Uh, Ivan, MoonPay's partnership with Binance US, which is the American affiliate of Binance in the US, there are banks that have walked away from Binance US. But they don't want to do business with them. Why are you doing a partnership there? So we work with a range of partners. Binance US, they have a infrastructure around wallets, right? So we can make it easy for them to top up their wallets. MoonPay, we obviously perform KYC. We follow all the regulatory rules across every single jurisdiction in which we operate. And so we can make it easy for people to top up their wallets. But we have a number of different partners, including Binance US. Banking partners, and more broadly, just the environment. How is the regulatory environment? to operate in the US at the moment? Are you feeling like you're supported? Are you feeling like, gosh, should we make sure that we're looking abroad to beef up our, our presence a little bit more? So MoonPay, we're an international business. We operate in 160 countries. United States, obviously a very important jurisdiction for us. We operate here. We have money transmitters in the majority of the United States. Um, for us, we're continuing to work proactively with regulators. That's an incredibly important part of our business. We want to make sure that we can comply. I think we're getting to a place where we're trying to get clarity over how to define these different assets. Are they going to be commodities? Are they going to be securities? How do we get them into these respective buckets? And I think, hopefully, do the you've probably seen the you know upcoming rulings that are, that are coming in place. You know, obviously we have jurisdiction uh, between the different regulators trying to figure out who should have jurisdiction over these digital assets. Uh, I think we will get to a conclusion, hopefully within the next year. All right, Ivan Soto Wright, co-founder and CEO of Moon, MoonPay, and also Caro on the road to test your tech in real time. <laughs> really appreciate that one. Thank you for your time. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, we're going to discuss the state of the venture capital industry with John Caden, founder and managing partner of Torch Capital. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for VC Roundup. And first up, venture capital activity here in Canada. Staged a rebound in the second quarter, led by an artificial intelligence company in Toronto in particular that drew out money from NVIDIA. Plus, Turkish startup Getir will cut more than 10% of its global workforce as a rapid delivery service struggles with losses in more markets in which it operates. Meanwhile, also global, Africa's largest startup, that's Flutterwave, is pressing ahead with plans for initial public offering after making headway in resolving allegations of financial impropriety in Kenya so that it can access more and bigger international partners. That's all according to the CEO. Ed. Yeah, those are your VC and startup headlines. For more on the state of venture capital, specifically looking at consumer tech, we're going to bring in John Keaton, founder and managing partner of Torch Capital, a leading consumer VC firm. The, the big news of the day, John, is Arm filing for its IPO. And while I won't ask you about Arm specifically, I just wonder how much of a starting gun this is going to be for the tech IPO market broadly. Well, we hope with uh, there have been a few successful IPOs recently, and I think it's slowly starting to open back up. That said, 
I'm not convinced yet that this is the start of the rush. I think these are trickles, and we'll see how things how things move. I mean, I think the economy is still very uneven. I think investors are still very uneven, both on the retail side and within the private side. So, fingers crossed that it goes well, and that will encourage more uh, more IPOs. But uh, I still think. It's a, it'll be a volatile time for tech for the, the, the short, medium term. And of course, ARM itself, very much B2B, John. You've got a lot of expertise in the B2C space. And interesting, I was speaking with the CEO of Macy's just a little bit earlier. How much concern there is, lack of clarity on a consumer in the US right now. How are your consumer tech enabled businesses doing in this environment? So I think you have to divide them. Uh, we saw obviously a lot of uh, froth around sort of traditional consumer type companies using tech enablement. They went public, they got hammered. They weren't really probably public ready companies, even though the they were funded like they were. Um, I think real consumer tech is still uh, always a massive opportunity because tech is constantly changing consumer behavior. I think we see that in AI. I mean, look at the explosion of usage of the average everyday consumer with, with chat GPT and open AI and BARD and so on. And I think we're at the very beginning of that. And that's what's really exciting about investing in consumer tech, because tech is always changing. Consumer behavior is always evolving, creating new opportunities in new markets. You know, for example, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's interesting. I was speaking, of course, with other key VCs in the space, some who know an awful lot around the consumer as well. And when we're talking to companies around AI, they're worried that there's froth at the moment in particular, and valuations have got too heady. Are you feeling the same at the moment? Absolutely agree with that. Uh, if we look back in history, you know, Google wasn't the first search engine. It wasn't the second search engine. It was like the 10th, 11th, or 12th. And we are at the very, very beginning of the first inning with AI. And so trying to anoint winners and kingmakers is very challenging because we have no idea if those will be the companies that get it right in the next three, five, ten years of, of where consumers are truly using it and what the commercialization is. So there are a lot of baby AI companies that are getting enormous valuations. And I think in the last year and a half, overall in tech, valuations have been deeply compressed. Um, but where they're inflated is around AI. And so there's just a lot more uncertainty. And I think VC funds are, are going after them like they're sure things, which they're not. We're still very early. Very exciting revolutionary opportunity but we're early to pick the winners. John, uh, Torch Capital was in the headlines earlier this year. The information reported you'd raise about 200 million for a second fund. What's the status of that mm -hmm. fund? Have you been shopping yet with any of the funds raised? Yeah, I, I think, you know, last year we did very few deals. I mean, Torch, we've part of our thesis and how we operate is to be very focused and disciplined, which I think we did pretty well over the last two years in the froth around the whole tech uh, arena. But right now, we are seeing valuations come down, especially in early stage. We're seeing a lot of very smart, focused founders. This is not a fun time to start and build a company and try to raise uh, funds for that. And so you're seeing very determined uh, founders or, or experienced founders. And with valuations down, we're seeing, and, and technology again changing, we're seeing a lot of interesting opportunities. For example, one of our portfolio companies called Durable. Uh, one, uh, an area that we're investing a lot behind is the rise of the solopreneur and small, small business owners. It's the fastest growing part of the U.S. economy. And uh, they actually use AI, but uh, they're basically helping founders get from zero to one to start a business. And part of that is their website. And they can build a website in under 30 seconds that's customized and can take payments and really get a business up and running. And in their first six months, they built four million websites and helped four million businesses get off the ground. And so we're seeing, starting to see flashes of where the next generation of companies are going to come from. And so we've actually done three times as amount of deals that we did last year uh, already in the first half of this year. So we're very active yes. in the space. You know, a data point we've been talking a lot about on the show is that in the first half of this year, 50% or more of all of the VC dollars going to an AI startup went to one in San Francisco. You talked about where the next generation in the world you operate is coming from. Is there any clear geographical divide in where you're investing and where new companies are being started? I think it's, I frame the question differently. I, I think it's all over. I think uh, this company is based in Vancouver. We actually invested in another very exciting company in Vancouver. 
We're seeing companies all over the country. It's not completely focused on San Francisco and New York. Uh, and I think between COVID and, and, and the ability to, to get talent and the uh, commonality of remote work, amazing startups have been built all over the country, which I think is very exciting. Uh, and also, there's not just a, a pure concentration as there used to be. So we're looking everywhere and we're very excited about a number of regions. And John, just to bring this sort of full circle, we started by discussing ARM and whether the IPO pipeline might be able to, well, start to flesh out a bit. But exits more broadly, are they just on ice? Are you seeing that big companies are willing to start to make a bit of M&A as an exit choice? They're on ice. Uh, I, I think there has been a valuation reset. We are not near the bottom. I think growth companies and pre-IPO pre companies are much better at cutting costs and extending runway. So they haven't really hit the open market with new raises. We've seen some like Stripe and some others, some of the biggest ones. But the true reset hasn't happened. And I think both growth funds and M&A uh, strategics are all just sort of waiting on the sidelines and saying not until we know we're hitting the bottom are we going to start uh, deploying capital. So I think we'll, we have a little bit to ways to wait. I think it'll be toward the end of this year and early next year that we'll see true where true valuations sit. And then I think M&A is going to be explosive. Mm -hmm. It may not always be pretty for, for, for some of the valuations we saw in 21, but I think it's, it's going to be a minute before we see a, a full-fledged M&A uh, back, back to market. We keep on waiting, John Keaton. Great to have some time with you at Torch Capital. We thank you. Thank you for having me. From New York, from somewhere out east of New York, and from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Time today to look at what the internet is talking about in today's Going Viral. Scooter Braun, the manager to music superstars, think Justin Bieber. Well, he's losing two key clients, Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato. And you may know Braun from pretty famously embroiled in that feud with Taylor Swift. When he purchased, of course, the master recordings of her first six studio albums, Ed, that prompted her to go and re-record them, stop them being used in ads, basically stop the money flowing to the entity that he'd purchased it with. He's then since sold that entity. In fact, he's made disposals to... South Korean companies in particular, but it is fascinating that many are now trying to wonder as to whether there's love lost here. Apparently, Demi Lovato, actually, they're still good friends, according to the internet. It's what people are talking about, but interesting, that story you just outlined could be one of the headlines potentially scrubbed from X. Ah. That's right. According to reports, the social media platform previously known as Twitter is planning to remove headlines from news articles and other texts that shared on the platform, Bloomberg's Asia Counts joins me on set. Explain it to me. Yeah, so it's exactly what you said, right? If you post an article, the headline's not going to be there. So it's just going to be an image. And then you'll have to, you know, whatever you want to post around it. But it's, it's kind of a weird thing, right? Like, there's going to be no headlines, no descriptions, just an image. I thought this was supposed to be the global town square where people are free to share what they want. I guess you can as long as it fits within the rules of X, right? Right, within the rules and sort of the, the boundaries there. But yeah, it, 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 it's interesting change. I mean, it'll make things look very kind of like TikTok-y, I guess, very visual or like an Instagram. Whether it's good or bad, I think that we'll have to see. And this is all about bringing eyeballs, right? It feels that all of these changes that perhaps seem odd to the lay consumer, it's all about trying to dupe us to go back in there and use it more. It's all about engagement, right? If you think about people like pictures. And so Musk has been pretty vocal about wanting to do pictures and videos and, and sort of move that way. But the challenge is that you lose a lot of context, right? You imagine like an image, you don't know if it's an article, you don't know if someone's just posting a picture. Mm. And so you lose a lot of information there. And I think that's what's challenging. And I think that's why people are sort of struggling with this idea. And we wonder again how the advertisers are going to react to all of this. I'm sure lots of calls still coming, Linda Yaccarina's direction. We thank you, Asia Counts. Great breakdown. And in fact, Ed, you're back. We're back together. But that's the, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Yeah, massive week. You know, we have our IPO news. We have earnings continuing with NVIDIA in 24 hours of time. But good start to the week. Don't forget the podcast, wherever you get yours, Spotify, iHeart, and on the Bloomberg platforms from New York and SF, this is Bloomberg.